<laughs> Aloha, good morning. Here we are again with Stacy to the rescue. <laughs> it, just, it still makes me laugh. Anyway, my name is Stacy Hayashi, and today we are talking to two uh, boat owners, uh, fishing crews, foreign fishing crews, and what's the real truth? So we have Kang Dang and Jim Cook, both of the Hawaii Long Line Association. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Yeah, Thank thanks you for having us on the show. On the show. Yeah. So let's assume that the people out there have seen that AP article about the floating prisons. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about that? You want to take the lead on this, Jim? I could. Um, <laughs> well, there are very few prisons that you can get out of at your own free will. <laughs> perhaps that you it opt was, into. Uh, perhaps it was a, a little... A little uh, a little slanted in that way, yeah. and, and yes, Just of course, we have seen um, the articles, and we are very concerned about them, and we're in the midst of doing quite a number of things about them. So, if you'd like, I could tell you a little of the history of the use of foreign crews here. And uh, sure, yeah, that'd be great. So, um, the fishery, the longline fishery in Hawaii, dates back to 1919, when Japanese immigrants started longlining in Hawaii. And through all of those years, up until the late 60s, it remained with a fleet of 40 to 60 boats. And then people from the mainland be, be, became interested in the fishery. And between the late 60s and kind of the end of the 80s, the, flute, uh, the, the fleet grew up to around 45 boats. And then really in the next five or six years, mushroomed up to around 140 boats. And that's where it is today. Um, crew members in ha, have be, prior to 1987 have always been domestic hired hired here. In 1987, Coast Guard passed a law that allows us to use foreign crews on on our vessels, and that was the time at which we started to do that. And I think the real impetus for for using uh, foreign crews was that local domestic crews who were very difficult to get doing this kind of work. And so over the period between around 88 and, I don't know, probably up into the 2005, around in there, I, I would say somewhere around 90% of the vessels in the fleet uh, converted to foreign crews, as it has become increasingly harder to, to find um, domestic crews. And um, these Maybe you can share a little bit more about that. Why is it so hard to find a local crew? Fishing is extremely hard work. Fishing is dangerous work. These are documented facts. And our society, it just become harder and harder to do. And in fact, when we look back at the history that goes into the early 90s and 80s, when we look at who was working on the boats, in, in many of those cases, they were compact people. So they were from Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands, Pacific Island people who were able to get green cards and come, come to Hawaii and, and work in the fleet. And we, we very seldom saw what you'd call real local people, just not, not many at all. And then as the fleet grew and the amount of jobs grew, you know, it became more and more difficult. And the nice thing about these foreign crews is they're well vetted by agencies and very professional and so it's 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 it's, it's a lot nicer for for the boats mm -hmm. um and actually but there are boats that have local crews too, yes right yes yeah probably i'd say maybe up to 20 boats have local crews um i think uh, john miking who has two boats with local crews was interviewed the other day and he is now in the process of transitioning his vessels to foreign crews mm. just just because it becomes harder and harder to uh, to, to, to find local people mm -hmm. who can do the job. Right. So Kang, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your experience. So I'm, I mean, my family has been in the business for about 25 something odd years. So um, I've always been in, in and around the fishing industry growing up. But it wasn't until recently, maybe about five years ago, that you know I kind of you know dove in head first into the industry, and you know learned exactly how everything worked. And, you know, Jim was instrumental in kind of you know helping me you know get acquainted with you know what we do, um, not only on the boat owner side, but what challenges there are 
as part of the Hawaii Longline Association. So in my experience with the foreign, uh, foreign fishermen, we've been using them for as long as I know. And personally, we have a lot of returning crew members. Um, just recently, um, I spoke with, um, f as far as we go, most of our foreign fishermen are fi of you know, Filipino nationality. Mm -hmm. So I just spoke with our Filipino manning agent this morning, and um, we just had the Philippine consulate come down, interview um, their nationals, and just ask them generally how happy they were with um, the living conditions and the working conditions. And from what I've heard from the, uh, our agent, he says they're very happy with the amount of food they're receiving, the fresh water, um, the pay, and the working conditions. And they're all generally very happy. Mm. I, I think your your uh, people watching the show would be interested in knowing of the process of obtaining foreign crew. So the way that that process works is there are manning agencies in several different countries. In Hawaii, we use foreign crew from Vietnam, from Kiribati, um, from the Marshall, uh, from uh, uh, Indonesia. Philippines, and Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And so the, the process is, if you want to get a foreign crew, you contact a manning agency, you tell them what your requirements are, and they'll come back to you with a roster of, of maybe three or four times more people than you need, and then you can look at what the experience levels are and then and pick an experience level. And, and so that's how you basically interact to, to get the crew. So <clears throat> these crews have a contract. So the, the owner of the boat has a contract with a foreign manning agency. And these manning agencies aren't only involved in fishing, they're involved in cruise ships, they're involved in oil tankers, and, and they're big. I think that the Philippines, for example, I, I, I don't know, but there's a really huge amount of Filipinos working overseas in all, all kinds of, of work. And it's a big source of income to the, to the Philippines. Sure. So um, that's, that's the process in, in getting them. Then, then to actually get them on the boat, maybe Ken can, can tell you a little bit about that. It's kind of an involved process. Yeah, so a lot of it is kind of teamwork within the fishing community in and of, in and of itself. So um, a lot of times everyone, uh, a boat will announce that, hey, we're going to go pick up you know, crewmen um, based on U.S. Coast Guard regulations and what Customs and Border Protection prefers. Um, you're allowed to pick up X number of crewmen for your own vessel. And on top of that, depending on when the boat was um, constructed, you can either uh, carry up to eight additional passengers or 12 additional passengers um, to bring them back to um, the, the, to Hawaii to distribute them to the different uh, fishing vessels. So currently, most of our crew pickups, um, we have a lot of the crew flying into American Samoa, which is about a two-week trip away from Honolulu. So the boat will head down there, yeah. pick up the crewmen, bring them back, and then um, upon coming into the United States, um, Customs and Border Protection usually meets us dockside to make sure that um, all the crews are vetted, all the crews are um, aware of their contract situations, and then their um, picked up by their owners and, and transported to their vessels that they're going to be working on. Mm. And so, as, as you know, the status of the crew technically is what is called detained on board. <clears throat> they don't have a visa, so they're not cleared to enter into the state, really. But the Customs and Border Patrol people allow them free access to the piers at which you go. So they can go into, at our place, they can go into Nikos or POP and, and buy things and visit very often they're visiting over on an adjacent boat right. and friends and, and that kind of thing. I think a lot of the focus, or s some of the focus, in Martha Mendoza's AP article had to do with wages. And I'd like to, I'd really like the general public to sort of understand this, if, if possible. So the crew member has a contract, and the wage on the contract is usually low. It could be anywhere from four to $600 a month. And so the norm is that the vessel owners are paying a minimum of the crew contract and then bonuses on top of it. And it varies. It varies from vessel to vessel. And I don't doubt that there may be vessel owners who are stri stri strictly paying that. So we come down to the issue of, of the wage. And, and what you have to realize is that these people are not admitted into the U.S. So all of their money basically goes back to to where they live. If you look at a situation with a regular domestic crew who say might be making $3,000 a month, 
uh, and you put, you turn him loose into the Hawaiian economy, you know a $3,000 a month will get you here. But you take these people who are working at these low wages and they interject their money and they, they make, our, our crew members on our boats probably make at least 10 times as much as it would if they were in their native country. So when it comes down to how do you pay domestic crews, Domestic crews, uh, under IRS law, if you have 10 crew or less on a boat, are allowed to work as an individual contractor on percentage of catch. So if I say to you, Stacy, I want to hire you on my boat, I'm going to pay you one-tenth of one percent of some adjusted number, and you say yes, you're on. <laughs> so we go out fishing and we come back and I hand you $2.73, I say have a nice day. It's entirely legal. <laughs> and, 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 and when you think about it, in the long history of fishing, it's got to be that way. Right. Be, because it's, there's, there's, it's not as though we're going in and, and, and in a day's work, I know you're going to sew 250 pairs of jeans. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going to sew any jeans. Right, right, because fishing yeah. is so, fishing. So uh, when we get down to the hours issue, I think whether you're a domestic crew or you're a foreign crew, or you're a guy like me who has driven these boats around in the ocean before. The hours, 40 hours a week, eight hours a day, we don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. This industry f right. is functions and for many days, crew members will be sitting there doing nothing. We get on the fish and start fishing, it's fine. So we wake up in the morning at six o'clock, set gear usually takes four to six hours. They eat lunch and pack fish from the night before and probably start hauling that gear back maybe at around six in the evening and it, it could easily take them 12 hours to get the gear back and if there are a large amount of fish or a large amount of, of challenges with current moving the gear around it's not unusual it'll take 15 16 hours to get a set of gear back and you're sitting around here talking about work hours and minimum wages in the fishing industry i don't care whether you're here Alaska, China, the Philippines, California, that's how we work. Mm -hmm. And if you think carefully about it, that's how we have to work. Oh. And it's actually kind of similar to agriculture as well, right? It, I mean, it's, it's similar. you have yeah. lo these local, local people don't want to do those jobs. It's a lot of work, yeah, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think a lot of and people I, And I think, uh, to uh, a comment about living conditions, mm -hmm. to, the, to the best of my knowledge, the living conditions aboard the boats are not a product of the nationality of the crew on the boat. So if I had a domestic crew, conditions are the same on my boat as if I have a foreign crew. Mm -hmm. And are they conditions that the general public would be clamoring to take a cruise with me? No. <laughs> <laughs> a fishing boat is a very tight, cramped place, and, and there you wouldn't want to go. Yeah, you know? I have to agree with you there. I was with Carl Jellings on the Akule boat, and oh, that's yeah. just that's a day boat. Yeah. And I was just like, I can't believe these people do this. It's so tough. It's such yeah. hard work. Um, and actually, I'm gonna end right there because we have a we have to go to a break right now, but we'll be back in a few seconds. Hi, I'm Tyler Sabota and I was actually a guest host on Carl Campagna's Think Tech Hawaii show, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. And I think you should tune in every Wednesday to find, find out more about what it is. That's all. Take care. Aloha. I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon, thinktechhawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, aloha. We're back with Stacey to the Rescue. We're talking to two members of the Hawaii Longline Association, Jim Cook and Kang Dang. And we're talking about the these very serious allegations, actually, you know, of that AP article and these floating prisons and uh, 
and actually, I, I'd like to point out that the boat was never named. You know, yeah. so these are very serious allegations, and it's having a very real effect on you guys. That, um, that, you know, that that's correct. They are very serious allegations, and uh, I want you to know that we take them as serious allegations, and we're not sitting there just hoping for this to go away. We don't think it'll go away. We think we need to be very active in it. So the uh, Hoi Long Line Association in combination with uh, Hoi Seafood Committee is really doing a number of things. One of the most damning allegations was that there was slavery and human trafficking involved in the fleet. So we hired um, a, a lady who has international credentials in human trafficking, slavery, and extensive experience in Southeast Asia on this very subject. And, and we asked her to help us design something to assure that this wasn't occurred. So she came up with a, 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 a crew contract. And the crew contract is designed strictly ar around those human safety allegations. And if we can, if the crew is willing to work on this contract and sign this contract, it's a demonstration that no human trafficking is taking place. We, we are trying to have in this situation, and really will have, a zero tolerance situation. So without the crew identification, that is their I-95 and their passport, without signed crew contracts, you will not be allowed to unload fish at United Fishing. Mm -hmm. So I, my vision is that if there's anybody out there that has some kind of a problem, we're, we're shortly gonna find out about it through that. Furthermore, the, the Long Island Association has, has created a, a couple of inspection forms. One of them deals with the allegation that there are substandard conditions on vessels, that people don't have food, that people don't have water. Mm -hmm. And so we have a vessel inspection sheet, and then we have in the, in the language, whether it's Vietnamese or whatever it is, we, we have a questionnaire for the crew member. So our intention at this point, we're in the process of hiring a third party to go in and survey all of our boats. And admittedly, uh, at this point, it's, a, it's what I'd call kind of a, a wide filter. What we're, what we're trying to do is get out there very, very quickly, assess all of the boats and say, okay, we don't have a problem, or we do, and here are the people that we have this problem with, and we intend to go to them and, and try to get them to remedy them. I think it'll probably take us probably 30 days to get all the boats. You have to remember that these aren't big fleets of boats. These are 140 individual businesses that you're, right. that you're talking about. Right, and they're out fishing. And they're out fishing and they're back. And so it, it takes time to get mm -hmm. things. Once we're done with that, we have been working with some of the larger retailers. And the larger retailers are really asking for us to undergo operational uh, audits using third parties. So we have been talking to United Labs, which I think is kind of the largest certification organization in the world. And we're working with their office. And what I, what I foresee is that within a period of about six months, we'll likely be under that kind of a regime. And that kind of regime means that these people will be auditing conditions on the boats and making, making reports. So um, it's been interesting for me. I've never done this kind of work. It, it's, it's like that petal and the flower and just keeps <laughs> peeling pieces off of it, uh, but we're getting it and, and um, we're on it and, and it, it's important to us. These allegations are important to us and so we're, we're taking action. Ken, you're mentioning a lot of your, your boat crews, they keep on coming back and... Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, generally because they're happy and a lot of them, you know, find this as a great way to make more money than they would otherwise if they were working in you know their home country so um, yeah sometimes they're making up to I don't know eight to twelve times as much as they would back home so they're saving up sending their kids to college you know buying a home back in their home country mm -hmm. so um, and they're happy with their living conditions and I think what's important to know is that our industry isn't free from you know current you know inspections so um, I mean for all of the boats that uh, Actually, fish aren't you guys totally like highly monitored yeah. compared so, to yeah, exactly so other countries most right of, uh, that's on the fishing sustainability standards so responsible fishing in general mm -hmm. but as far as the crewmen uh, foreign crewmen go um, 
all of the boats that fish in and out of Hawaii are located within about three miles of each other, yeah. between Pier 16 through 18 and Piers 36 through 38. So Customs and Border Protection here locally actively monitor the crew situation. So they're doing tons of random inspections where they're making sure that all of the crew members that are supposed to be on board are you know, on board and on the vessel. And then further, every time they come down, they're asking, hey, how are the living conditions? Um, are you getting enough food? Are you getting enough fresh water? If you need emergent medical attention, it, is that being provided for you? And lastly, if you want to go home, please let us know. Mm. So right after the AP article was released on September 8th, on September 9th, they actually had a meeting down at both of those the main pairs where they gathered all of the foreign crewmen. And it was a meeting, it was kind of a forum where um, the owners and captains weren't allowed to attend so that they, the foreign crewmen can speak, speak freely. freely. Mm -hmm. So they re-emphasize all of these things one more time. Hey, are you getting paid according to your contract? And all those same you know, humanitarian questions for living conditions and just making sure that they're getting enough food. And they gave them like cell phone numbers and there's already signs posted down at the pier saying that, hey, if you're subject to any kind of abuse or your living con uh, appropriate living conditions aren't being provided for you, then please reach out to us and we will rectify the problem immediately. Have you heard of anything no. Coming back? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no uh -huh. one left? <laughs> no, not that I know Gee, of. Gee, yeah. so um, maybe. Yeah, re regardless of what, of what we're hearing back and, and all of the good stories, we're not, we're not going to sit here and listen to good stories. We, we need to uncover the truth for ourselves, and we need to get into a monitoring situation, and, and our energies are, are going in that, in that direction. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. But it would help, right, to know which of these so-called boats are abusing um, absolutely. the right? You know, we're, we're fortunate here in that pretty much 100% of the fish that's landed in Hawaii flows through United Fishing. And we're fortunate in having a business in United Fishing that's cooperating, and that's, that's where the choke point is. You're going to be a bad actor, you better figure out what you're going to do with your fish because you're not going to sell it to United Fishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanted wanted to also reemphasize that you know back when it all started you know the Japanese fishermen came they were immigrants yeah. right <laughs> yeah. so you, you, you um, find that in, in fishing communities all over the country that immigrants mm -hmm. you know you have uh, on the East Coast you know and let's not that forget that white people are also immigrants <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Italians yeah down in the, in the Gulf you got a lot of Cajuns and you know it's uh, it's, it's, a, it's a funny business. You work really hard. Most of the time you don't make that much money. Why do you keep doing it? Yeah, and, it, mm -hmm. and people are kind of like, they're after you, too. There's nothing, Doesn't there's it feel nothing like, like that? It, you know, and I, like, I give you guys a lot of credit because I, I know it's a lot of work and you know, you, it's you, very you, difficult. You mentioned about the observers. We carry observers on 20% of the long line trips for tuna and 100% of long line trips uh, for swordfish. And um, if, if you look at observed long line trips in general, 87% um, of the observed long line trips in the Pacific are taking place on Hawaiian boats. And yet we make up less than 3% of the long line boats in the Pacific. Wow. So we are intensely observed. Our boats have mandatory Coast Guard inspections. Um, there's a lot there, but nevertheless, we're not sitting on it, we're getting on it. So that's what we're up to. Mm. It sounds all very expensive too. <laughs> As a fish eater, I'm uh, thinking, and the price of my ahi, my poke bowl is gonna go up. <laughs> I hope not. Oh gosh. Will we blame the AP for that? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to share with the public? I mean... Well, um, I don't know what, I, what, what more I can say. As we, um, as, we, as we put out things, we do intend on releasing them to the public. So the public will shortly see these crew contracts so they can get oh, an I idea of it was. And then as, as we get further down the line, the, you know, most of these big retailers, the, the Sam's Clubs and Walmarts and Costco's of the world, are into these social audits in countries that they go. And, and there are quite a few of them that are, that are throughout the, the fishing industry. 
I expect that we'll go to, to that point or to some point near that. And this type of auditing will probably continue to the life of the fishery. You know, I, don't, I don't expect it to change over time. Um, I think most of us understand that it's, it's expensive, we know that. Um, but we, we, can't, we can't have bad actors in our business, you know? Right. And I think it, you know, to, to a large extent, you have your business and I have mine and I happen to be in the restaurant business as well. And I, I'd hate to see a story that was teed off on the worst restaurants in town and begin to indicate that that's the case in all of them because it's not the way that it is. So that part of Martha's article, I, I think, is somewhat unfair. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been to the pier. I've seen the unloading at, you know, at United Fishing, and uh, the crew seem happy. And Well, you know, these are, these are professional crew, and they are with manning agencies and they have come to the manning agencies asking for work and I can tell you 201 every one of them I've talked to is, is Hawaii is the premier place to go mm -hmm. and I don't think it, it, it takes much for you to imagine what crew conditions might be like on an Asian vessel operating in the Pacific and in right. many cases those are freezer vessels, mm -hmm. and the trips can be six, nine months long, and yeah, it's a, it's a different thing. So, so Hawaii is... Basic human rights like the United States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and on that note, we are out of time, but thank you so much, both of you, Kang and Jim, for coming in to give the fishermen side of the story on Stacy to the Rescue. So, ahui ho.